basically, I just wanted to give you a short overview of the work that we're doing um, as the African Technology and Transparency Initiative. And what we do is that we find technology and transparency initiatives in such a way. So, it's, a, it's sort of like, you know, I wanted to give you an overview of the things that we're finding and how it pertains to open data or the lack thereof. And then the other thing that I would just hear with coming out from the conversations that were happening is how people, now the citizens that you're trying to engage, how they react to this data or how they're not reacting to the data. So it's about five to seven minutes and I'll be done. You can ask questions if you have any questions. So basically the Africa Technology Transparency Initiative is a joint initiative of Omega Network and Nobles. And it builds on the work that Omega Network has been doing with the media markets and transparency work. And the sterling work that he was, has been doing um, in the ICT and media component. So basically what we find are technology and transparency initiatives, but we find quite a thin slice of, you know, when you consider, when you map out all the tech or transparency initiatives that are going on, what we're particularly interested in are the activities that engage and activate citizens into you know, doing some sort of collective action and interacting with the government, interacting with public officials. And it's a pretty much, I want to say unmarked field, but I might not be quite the correct term. But it's a different way of engaging with people because you kind of find yourself moving away from you know, the old way of um, the NGOs as the custodians of you know, information, strategies, tactics, and techniques for dealing with government. And that's one of the things that, you know, as I think we move into crowdsourcing or um, activism or of governance, it's something that I think, you know, we all have to keep in the back of our mind, either as funders or as NGOs or as people who are supporting um, these initiatives of people. So, some of the work, um, the operating environment that we work in, um, some of the things that we found out um, to be important is that in Africa, it's been said before here that you know, mobile is key. That's one of the areas that we really concentrate when it comes to you know, you start thinking of funding, the things that are going to be funding. But then the other thing that's also been coming up is the issue of, um, I think Brenda Burrell from Freedom Poverty Best, where she said poverty is censorship. So you have the way that people use cell phones in Africa. Um, and sorry to refer to Africa as a country. I know it's a continent, so <laughs> I think my apologies in advance. But the way people use cell phones is you have certain units, you know, so you have a euro. And you know I'm going to make three phone calls and send six SMSs. And I'm going to put just enough to be able to make the necessary phone calls that I want to make. And for those people that I, you know, they wanted to speak to me, but I'm not that interested in putting the time you know, to speak to them, I'll put just enough to flash them, which is you know, enough credit to call and then hang up. So that's the way that people tend to use their cell phones. So even as we're funding um, initiatives that need to go by SMS, even as we're working as NGOs that rely on SMSs for providing information from the cloud, um, we find that this, you know, this very key group, they have cell phones. They have some money for putting money in the cell phones. One of the things that's going to happen is that you effectively be sensitive their input into the democratic process, unless you're willing to kind of like work around this. So some people of course have been using talk phones, which you know comes with its pros and its cons and you know there's all that. It is something a problem to you, you can certainly put the three shillings that you need you know, to make a change in your life. Mm -hmm. So you kind of go to that whole you know, self-determination, governance, that whole self-sustainability aspect of it. But there's also been interesting work where people have started marrying like IVR technology and SMS phones, where right now you don't even have to worry about that issue of you know, things like literacy. You know, I know English enough to get by, but I don't necessarily know enough English to um, governance hashtag space report a problem. That's all about my head. 
So that's the other thing that I think is really interesting that's coming from the field, that marrying of SMS and IVR technology. And then um, I think the third thing in the operating environment that's really interesting is the increase in internet penetration. So most guys, of course, with their online in Africa, their continent again, using mobile SMS, I'm sorry, using mobile internet. And when you now put in the fourth um, leg of the pillar, uh, which is the growing of uh, guys of, of the tech community. So you find that we have an environment that I think is primed and ready for getting people to kind of engage um, in their governments and work with um, people like NGOs and other funders who are funding these projects to promote technology and mm -hmm. So some of the issues that um, we're working on is um, like public service delivery. A good example is the platform that Philip and Kate talked you through, which is creating a way in which people can actively engage with a platform to provide information about their services and then lead back to the government and create accountability. Because sometimes we talk a lot about the open data, open data, open data. And I think we have to create that link between transparency because transparency doesn't necessarily lead to accountability. There has to be extra work that's done to kind of close this uh, And I think that is where you know, the services, like what Philip was talking about, actively going in and creating ways in which the citizens can then create change, hopefully on their own, and supporting this process to create accountability in the countries that we're working in. So the other sectors that we're working are elections transparency. There's also been interesting work that's being done around kind of like start contracting the work of election monitoring and even post-election monitoring through platforms like Richard Lucy. Um, there's also like the extractive industry transparency and there's a huge initiative through the IET and uh, the Publish What You Fund, Publish What You Pay Coalition, where if you look at the problem, it's a very legitimate issue. Like there's a figure that's thrown around like 40% of all companies in Africa have that genesis in the allocation of natural resources. So it's not you know, like a frivolous issue, like, okay, let's live with it, you know, we have nothing to do. It's something that's really, really pertinent. So, and when you come down to, you know, countries, like you look at the statistics, like Ochoa Guinea has the GDP of, I think, Netherlands, not Netherlands, Belgium, something like 38,000 uh, euro annually. But if you look at what the real GDP of the people is, it's something like, I don't know, 900 um, euro annually. So it's trying to shine a spotlight on things like this and getting the citizens to actively participate in the monitoring and the use of their extractive industries and the natural resources. Um, I'll power down to the rest. There's also like budget transparency and natural resource transparency, things like forests, you know, which sounds very touchy thing, but when you think about it, like, a good example is something like the Kenya where, you know, forests are, you know, theoretically the government is a custodian of them. But if you look at the way they're planned and the way that there's no proper management of these resources, they are also political and environmental, like very real impact on, um, on people. If you look at Madagascar, for example, uh, something like half the Arab land had been leased out, which is what some people attribute to, um, I don't want to call it the general Jamia, but you know, him, like the reasons why there was that huge unrest in Madagascar. So basically, I think the general thing in, in summation, as I have a feeling I'm closed by five to seven minutes. <laughs> I think the biggest thing that comes out of like the work that we're doing is that be you a funder, an NGO, a researcher, etc. One of the things I think we have to be prepared to do is to actually go out and help get this data. A group we work with in Nigeria, um, they want to provide legislative advocacy. They want to support activists in the work that they're doing. Um, about, but the framework that we are working under 
is um, so these are the laws that have been passed, and these are the implications for you as an activist, for you as a citizen. But since 2004, the clerk of the National Assembly was asked, how many laws have been passed? And he's like, um. So he's asked, okay, so where can I get them? And, you know, guys are told, when you go to the, something like the national publisher, something, something. But the thing is, he has the books that he has, you know? So you find, I think, an utterly scandalous situation where a country doesn't have a record of it. the laws that have been passed, the people that being governed under. I mean, it was outrageous to me, you know? It's like, so what are we talking about, right? So if I commit a crime in 2004, and you discover that, in 2007, that was a crime. Mean, what what does that actually mean? So what they went is it's it's a very low tech. You know when we're talking about open data. Sometimes it's not even about apps or mashups. Sometimes it's going down to basics. It's you have a law. It's been typed out. It's in PDF form. It's you digitize it and you make it available online. So I think this is one of the things that's coming out. Like if you want to invest in open data, sometimes. You're going to go like really, 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 really good tech. You know, it's going to be, let's scan, let's index, let's create a system, let's zip it all up online. So that's one of the things that I think when you're working as an NGO on that, etc. Then you kind of like have to be prepared to do. The data is not necessarily going to be there in the form that you want. Or like really progressive governments who are going to be there. Or like really progressive governments, like, sorry, Philip, <laughs> I'm going to put Kenya. I'm going to kind of like <laughs> cook Kenya on the floor, where you have like really good census information. Like if you look at the data, you're like, yeah, this was a good census. And you're like, can I have the information? And you're like, oh yeah, there's like four copies. Print. So you're like, uh, okay, do you have it in soft copy? And you're like, no. And if you push, 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 then maybe you get a PDF. So it's things like this that I think are kind of the things that you have to be prepared, like you're working in the field, to be ready to. It's, it's a challenge and an opportunity um, to kind of meet and you know, kind of address head on. Um, finally, um, since we're working with people, uh, it's not just about opening up data. I mean, my act and slice of the market is also getting people to interact with, with, with this information. It's also realizing that you, know, you kind of like have to find a new way of engaging with people so that you go from the Ikenya we call it to now Basarikani, which is we ask the government, we beseech the government, we beg the government to do that for us. And I think this is where the network is going to be. Because even when you have beautiful systems like Kudua, you have open data, you have all the ways of interacting with the, you know, with the providers. You have to also get people used to this new way of thinking where, you know, 